It's already a commitment coming from the Bali meeting that we have to put all these words into action. And I'm going to, again, uh, question my colleagues in the UNFCCC as to what they are now doing uh, so that uh, we can really have this, this commitment being translated into terms of action. And that really I look forward to the Poznan meeting in Poland that uh, there will be more, in terms of proportion also, uh, women participating in this preparation for our future negotiations to reach the, Kyoto, the second Kyoto uh, Agreement. The problem that, that I see at the moment together with my colleagues in the United Nations uh, is that there's so little, so little explicit research work on gender and climate change that has been done. And so again, really, uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, knowing that I was coming to this meeting, they asked me whether your Congress could offer us uh, some valuable insights and that you can help to relay to us some of the highlights of your meetings uh, so that we can find ways and means to support what we'll have to participate. We have to know where, when, how, what are the institutions, what are the rights, what kind of information flow can we provide so that we can get everyone involved. Are the donors doing this? Are the donors mobilizing women to participate? So all this will have to be, uh, again, uh, research and then systematically translated into terms of action. My main premise uh, for this morning address uh, is based on, on this fact. That gender and climate change can be a vicious circle of worse premise on which if, if we're not going to change uh, the things uh, that are being played out in the world today, then this is going to worsen inequalities. And inequality is not among rich and poor, but among men and women. As you know, it has already been well documented that climate change affects women more than men. All of us are saying this. Women are more affected than men. This is because of the existing inequalities, and this reminds me of the fact that in the world today, if you talk about rich countries and poor countries, participation in climate change policy, the richest countries in the world emit carbon dioxide per head and I won't name names, I mean, uh, I would like to say on average, richer countries emit about 20 tons of carbon dioxide per head per year. 20 tons per head per year. An average person from a poor country would emit something around about 10, one to two tons of emissions per head per year. In, in Africa, it's less than half a ton per year, per head. You, you can see the differences, the inequalities in the way people are actually destroying the environment. But you look at the consequences. The consequences, if you look at global warming, as you see now, UNFCCC is trying to keep global warming in the next couple of decades to below 2%. Might not be possible. But global warming indicates there will be a lot of fluctuations of droughts and floods. And for those who live on islands and live by the beaches, they will be hurt very badly. And there are countries around the world, particularly in South Asia. In South Asia. Now, so those who would be at the receiving end of all the negative consequences from climate change will be those poorest people living in the poor countries. Do you know that in advanced economies, particularly in Europe, with rising temperature, I was told that now grapes and vineyards can be cultivated in, uh, in Great Britain. So next, uh, next few decades, you will see UK producing more wine competing with the southern part of, 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 of Europe. So global warming has also unequal distributional factors. The rich major emitter of carbon dioxide, I wouldn't say major gainers of the emission, but of course, Global warming reduces the uh, temperatures in the north, so less expenditure on, 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 on heating of the, of the houses and, and offices. Whereas the poor will get to be more and more marginalized, lose their land, lose their livelihood, and things like that. So this is really, again, I would say a very un unfortunate affair. And so it is, it is ironic uh, that this uh, could be allowed to happen. And so 
hopefully in the next rounds of negotiations, not only are the rich and the poor countries uh, going to be party to these negotiations, but at the same time, men and women, boys and girls will also be party to, uh, to these negotiations. This vicious circle, uh, the inequality that could be exacerbated uh, through gender and climate change, can have a devastating effect on economic and trade growth and can also significantly delay achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. These problems go beyond gender and climate change. They also affect the role of women in the environment, in disasters, in business and in trade. In all these areas, the root cause of problems is gender inequality. First of all, let, let's examine how climate change can worsen gender inequalities. Women and girls in developing countries are more affected by climate change and disasters than men. This is not only because they are weaker physically, but also because social and economic restrictions